Hold up, it's a little slower. Okay, here we are. Here. What's cracking, everybody? It's your favorite starving musician, Jackie Jordan. And you are tuned in to the first episode of a short podcast with Jackie Jordan. I am your host, Jackie Jordan. And today, I have a lot that I want to discuss with you all. But before we get into it, we have a special guest. But before we get into him, do me a favor. Hit the like on this video. Hit the subscribe button. Click the little bell next to it so you get a notification every time we drop a video. And after you get done listening to this intriguing piece of content, I want you to comment below and let me know what you think. I like The Rock or anything. It doesn't matter what you think. No, I care what you think. I would like to know what you think. So please comment after you get done watching this video. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce my first guest, the very first guest on a short podcast with Jackie Jordan. This is the gentleman who I've been knowing for a very long time. This is a guy who I've done a lot of work with personally in the studio. This is one of my friends in this music industry. One of the most talented rappers and musicians that I have ever met or ever had the pleasure of being on the song with. I want to introduce you all to Kay the Feature. Hi, the Feature. And you may have changed your name. What's this Trifoli thing? Trifoli, how you pronounce that? It's a, yeah, you got it right, Trifoli. You know, it's a, uh, it's an alter ego of sorts. Alter ego. Okay, tell us a little bit more about that. Yo, so I came up with the Trip Foley thing. First of all, it's a, it's an homage to uh, to Mick Foley, my favorite wrestler, man of three hats. Um, and basically, in this persona, in this uh, alter ego, I um, I get personal. It's, it's like my alter ego, so I can get as personal as I can about myself and and who I am as a person. Because I feel like as K to feature, I put on a, a a certain image. It's uh, a certain, um, it's like, it's like a Mr. Rogers type of thing. You know what I'm saying? It's fully, I could be a little unhinged because I get to be myself. Okay. So, so that kind of sounds a little bit like what I'm doing with the Jackie Jordan thing. It seems like we all got alter egos. Right, right. It, it keeps it keeps the uh it keeps the music fresh. It keeps things and new ideas floating because you know when you've been doing it as long as us, I mean it becomes a uh, not to toot my own horn, but it it becomes easy to the point where it becomes boring. And when it becomes boring, then the music you know the music don't sound good. Facts, facts, facts. So uh, first, tell your tell our audience a little bit about how you got started off in music um and we can and i guess we can touch a little bit on how we met um i met kai in eighth grade at blair middle school and we both used to sit at this table where everybody would come to this table and they would rap and they would fucking joke and join on each other and I knew from very early on that this guy was so super talented. He's one of the best freestyle rappers that I've ever met personally. Even back then, like he used to rap so fast. He used to... And you couldn't really understand what the fuck he was talking about. But goddamn, this motherfucker was spitting. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you got started off in music and how we met and what you thought about me the first time you met me. I'm gonna I'm gonna start off I'm gonna start off by saying I'm gonna start off by saying you we were the more polished artists at the time you know I started off as as a as a battle rapper freestyle rapper whatever you want to call it because that's how that's how I was I was raised around you know what I mean all my uncles rap all my uncles were rappers freestylers so I was always in the studio I was brought there whether I wanted to be there or I didn't want to be there you feel me so that's how 
that's how I got started with the rap shit. But by the time you met me, I was still early on. And um, my first thoughts, I was intimidated the first time I met you because you were the, one of the more. I'm going to explain why. I'm explain why. It's not, it has nothing to do with skill set more than it's about how clean you were rapping at that age. It was like very, you had it very structured and it was like, damn, this nigga has a formula. He has songs. He has the way he puts it together. It's already a notch above mine. I didn't have songs at the time. I just freestyled. That's all I did. All I cared about was freestyling. So, so when we first met, I was like, sheesh, I don't, I don't know if I want to, uh, I don't know if I want to um, hang around because I was hanging around and not just not to uh, put anybody down, but I felt like I was hanging around a lot of rappers at the time that were either doing it for fun or they were, I, I saw them as, as someone who wasn't as skilled as I was. And I looked at you and I felt like I looked at someone eye to eye, if that makes any sense. Well, it's crazy to me you told you said that you were intimidated because I kind of actually felt the same way. When I heard you lyrically, I was like, man, I'm not on that level yet. Um, I kind of had a little bit more of a swag, more of a rapper persona. But you, when it came to just pure bars and lyrics, I didn't feel like I could compete with you at the time. So it's crazy to hear you say that. So I know you said you started rapping, you know, you had other family members who was rapping and everything, but what made you want to make a career out of it? Tell me about the moment where you decided that rap was something that you wanted to do full time. Um, that came years years later when I uh, I dropped my first song, uh, a first official song, Seven Up. It was like a little freestyle where I did seven different flows in a short amount of time. I remember that. It was, it was at that moment I did that song, and I remember I remember going to sleep that night after I recorded it, getting it in the email, and then uploading it on on SoundCloud like I usually do. This was still a fun time for me, so I wasn't thinking too much of it. Uh, about a day goes by, I go to check on it, and it hit about like what five hundred views, and you know at at or five hundred listens, whatever you want to call it. Um, at that time, that's a lot. You know what I mean? Like when you've cursed coming up, five hundred is like. So can I curse? My bad. Can I curse? For sure. Go curse. Yeah, yeah. That shit is a fucking lot of views at the time. I'm like, God damn, what the fuck is five hundred? And then, you know that that number kept creeping up to a point where it got to about two thousand in in under a week. It was at that moment I was like, you know, I think I can, I think I could do this. I think uh, there's something here that I have. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I knew I wanted to pursue that, like that feeling that I had. So um, ever since then, it's been, it's been tunnel vision. You know, I, as always, there's always blockades, but you know, from that point on, I knew I was in this, whether it was going to be hard or easy. How instrumental was I in your early rap career? I would say um, at one point, I would say it was you were the main focus in, in my rap career. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, when I was when I first signed to uh, to Raw, to the label, uh, I even though I wasn't present on a lot of tracks and a lot of music, I felt like I had to rep that everywhere I went. So I I began mm -hmm. to do a lot of and battles. You see me? And I, I would I would rep that hard as I could. So it was very uh very instrumental. Yeah, so to the listening audience, those of you who don't know, at the age, at the tender age of 14 years old, I started my own rap label. I signed a bunch of my friends. An artist who I believed in to rap with us on our rap label. Our rap label was called Raw Entertainment. Our rap group was called UG Ma. And my buddy Kai here was one of the first members to join. And like he said, he didn't really put too much music out early on. 
um, if anything, he was a lot like the um, emotional support homie. And he would always come and give us, you know, just what we should do with the songs. He worked very heavily with an artist named KK, or also known as Young Picasso. They worked very closely together. But when you assemble a group of hard hair titans and hard nose vets, what tends to happen is a lot of egos tend to clash. People begin to fall out. Now, in maybe about 2015, me and this young Picasso artist, we fell out. Young Picasso and Kai were best friends, right? So right. this is what I like to call the great split. Whenever CC, young Picasso went and formed his own label for CC, his buddy Kai went and joined him. A bunch of other people joined. Everybody just let, left me. I guess I was a terrible leader or something. <laughs> but we started this rap beef where we were going back and forth. How did you feel kind of being the middleman between all of that? Because me and you, we've never had any issues, but you were also very close to Derek or Young Picasso. A lot of times you felt like you were being pushed in the middle but of our beef. Explain how that happened for you. You know, in in the beginning stages of the great, what we call the great split, right? It it was it's um it was bittersweet in the beginning, and the reason why I say it was it was sweet, I'll, I'll touch on that part first, is that you're also you're we're at a stage where we're hungry as rappers, and we want almost the battle, like we almost want something. Um, I wasn't even in tune to why it happened. Um, I just knew my close friend was beefing with another close friend, and I was I knew I knew one more than the other, so I needed to hold my friend down. I needed to hold this one down. Right. And it felt like I had an excuse to battle. But as you know, time goes on and it begins to get to the stage of, of where the beef begins to get petty and, and overplayed. And that's when I felt the bitter came in because that's when I start feeling like, okay, I'm un I'm uncomfortable now because it's, it's gotten yeah. to, we got to the point where there were there were threats and there were um it, it not saying it was gonna go above lyrical but it was it was serious and I felt yeah. like I, that serious it, my heart wasn't in it like that as you know we we've, we've never had any problems personally with each other. So when I felt like it was getting personal, that's when I start feeling very uncomfortable about the beef. I'm like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want it to be something like this. But what was the exact moment where you was like, okay, this is going a bit too far? You know, I would like to say it was when it became when you stop when it stopped being subliminal on your side because. In the beginning, it were undertones. There were it was both subliminal shots. When it became unsubliminal, and you guys were going straight track for track, that's when it started becoming uncomfortable. It started becoming like, okay, I don't, I don't think I want to be a part of this. Man, it was so much shit happening at that time. I can't even really remember all of it, but. I just know that it was a bunch of people bunny heads. It was not only me and young Picasso, but it was also Mandy and young Picasso. They were bumping heads. Mandy decided that he no longer wanted to be in the group because he didn't want to have any affiliation with young Picasso. So that eventually in some way led to me and Mandy beefing with each other because he left the group and started to align himself with TDG, who was our rival group at the time. And me being close to Mandy, I kind of felt like it was some betrayal type of thing going on. So this led to two, three years of deep and back and forth dis-songs between me and this person. Now, what made me Young Picasso's beef was was 
a lot of the times where I was dissing Mandy, when I was dissing CDG, he thought I was dissing him. So he would make diss songs, dissing me, responding to something that I said in one of my previous songs when I was really talking about these artists over here. I mean, personally, I just kind of got a little tired of it because me and, you know, me and Picasso, we would talk about these things. You know, I would explain to him, like, no, it's not this. It's, it's this person. Like, me and you were cool and everything like that. But it was like the this has kept coming. So eventually I got to a point to where I was just like, nah, fuck this. Like, I just got to stand on my own two feet here. And whenever we did the song Soul Food, you remember that? Yeah, I remember that song. I remember that. So, Fubu, whenever we finally decided, okay, CC, UG Moth, we're going to come back together, we're going to work together. And we did that by the song So Fubu. Now, I know not everybody who listens to this knows about this song, but this is a song in which I took it upon myself. I'm going to take full credibility for this one. I'm like, man, this is my version of the control verse, right? I'm going to competitively come at these two individuals, these two heavyweights that I'm on the song with. I'm going to competitively attack you on the same song. So that was my version of control. How did you feel whenever I did that control verse? Man, you know, I wish I could say I was mad. I believe I was the first to catch it. I remember me and Derek listening to it. Mm. I, I pointed it out. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, he's taking shots. And I remember him feeling uncomfortable and angry about it and me getting, I, I kind of got a, uh, what I call batters, battles adrenaline, where I was like, oh, shit. You know, as me and you both know, because we're both lyrical, pen heavy, and we're both known to, to battle, I instantly started thinking of rebuttals and shit I, I needed to say. Mm-hmm. When I heard it, I was more impressed and I was more like, oh, shit, this is a challenge, open challenge. It's time to it's time to showcase my abilities. Um, I think when I I looked at Derek, though, it looked like he took it more personal. And I think that's what kicked off a whole nother element. A whole nother between, way. <laughs> a whole nother, I, it, it became less competitive at that point because, you know, me, I'm like, oh, shit. So I looked at it like a control verse. I looked at it like the Kendrick where I was like, all right, we got to I got to step up. We got to we got to get competitive then. It is what it is. He looked at it as like blatant disrespect. And I think I knew right from that moment. I'm like, this probably isn't even my beef at this point. And look, for me to say this, honestly, it was coming from a place of bitterness because I had felt like I had done my best to kind of showcase all of the other artists on the label. I thought I was very unselfish in that. So when everything, when the original B first went down, I kind of felt the way about it because I felt like certain conversations were had to kind of change the way I'm viewed in certain people's eyes. So... It was kind of coming from a place of bitterness, you know, whenever I did what I did. And it was never really towards you. It was me, Picasso. It was her beef. But when that happened, like you said, it did string off a completely different battle that happened after that. And I remember dropping the back-to-back -back freestyle that summer where I went at everybody. At that time, it was still, you know, kind of just subliminals back and forth. We didn't start going bar for bar, actually calling each other out until we dropped the Urban Legends 2 project in 2000, at the top of 2016. Um, that was the one with me, Taz, and Marcus. This was after the first project with the original UG Moth group. Um, he listened to a song called Bling and he made his version of Bling he made a remix called Bling Shit and 
me and him had a song um, where I was talking about people's bodies. What's the, what's the name of that song? Um, you know, lean in them high as a bitch. Uh, lean in them high as a bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that was a uh, spot. That it's right on the tip of my head. The spot. Me and Derek did a song called "On the Spot," and this was supposed to be when we were bridging things up. You know, we was patching things up. Yes, but after this new iteration of the beef had popped off, he replaced my verse with you on the song. Tell me a little bit about how he came to you about that idea and what you thought about it. Um, at the time, uh, I didn't even know it reoccurred. I thought everything was, was squashed. So when he brought it up to me, this is where I, uh, his betrayal came towards me a little bit. And I'll explain that because he didn't, he didn't let me know that's what was going. That's the reason why I was going on this other remix. I thought I was going on this other remix because he just wanted a different verse I remember the ult- ult- the overall consensus was he wasn't feeling your verse. So mm-hmm. he did another remix. And I was like, That's all right. That's one of my favorite verses, by the way. <laughs> Yo, looking back at that verse, I was like, this is some real, I hope you take this as a compliment. This is some real, like, relapse Eminem type shit. I like, That's what it was intended to be. It was intended to kind of be a little weird and a little but. That shit was hard, though. Right, right. And I, I remember feeling, I still to this day feel like you have the better verse on, on the on the song. I didn't like I didn't like my verse because it was it was freestyled and rushed and, and last minute and way out of place. I didn't get a chance to feel the beat. I didn't get a he didn't even give me a chance whether I wanted to be on it or not. He just kind of was hey, hop on this track. So I, I did it. You can hear the uncomfortableness in my voice if you listen back. I'm pretty sure it's still on SoundCloud. You can hear that I'm uncomfortable rapping. On there. I don't... Hey, man, all sp- I know is that shit was hard, bro. I feel like you, me, and possibly Derek, we're like the unholy trinity. Like, as I know we talk about, you know, the control verse on Soul Food and everything like that. But that is still one of my favorite songs because you two gentlemen, you really came fucking play. I feel like each of us scored 30, 10 and 10. Yeah. He had a great game. Um, unfortunately, the beef and everything kind of overshadowed that. But I always wanted to bring everybody back together and potentially do a UG Moff um, reunion tape or something like that. Now, me and Derek, we've squashed our beef long ago. He's not even making music anymore, to my knowledge. He's a family man. He's got other things going on. Shout out to him. I don't know how possible it would be to get him on the song. I already know you're down with it. Uh, Marcus... He's down. Marquise YKM. He just lost his mother recently. Shout out to him. Um, keep your head up. Prayers and condolences to his family. Um, I he's not making music these days. I don't know if we'll be able to get him on the track. Has he's a go? Has he's down? Man, Mandy. Still a conversation that needs to be had between grown men, me and him. Um, but it may be possible. What do you think about a potential UG Moth reunion? I think um I think ultimately it's it's a great idea and I think it should happen. I feel like what better time right now? I feel like all of us are are as polished up as we ever been, but I don't think it could ever I mean, obviously, the times have changed, so it can never sound the same. Like it never, it, it can't be the same type of chemistry. It would, I feel like, it would ultimately be a different feel. But I feel like it, w- it would need to happen. Um, 
more more so because we've grown so much, I feel like the chemistry in making a song will be stronger than it's ever been. That's what so I'm excited I, I, for. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like I, I do I, agree I that it will not feel the same only because we're all at different stages in life. And it's kind of hard to recapture that same hunger, that same feeling that you had when you were 15, 16 years old. Um, not even rapping full time anymore. I, for the most part, I see on my records, you know, with an occasional rap verse here and there, but I don't really have the passion to rap like I used to. Because I kind of feel like I didn't already master that. Like, when we were all coming up, I felt like we brought the best out of each other because we all wanted to be the best. We all wanted to have the best verse. And it showed whenever we would collaborate and make music. I feel like I got to a point to where when there was no longer a group and I no longer had you guys to put that battery in my back and to fuel me, and then I looked at my other peers and everything like that. And then with music changing and kind of being more rhythmic based, and there was not really a big emphasis on lyrics, I kind of lost my passion for rapping. You know, it's what do you think about the current state of hip hop culture? It's at a, um, it's like a, to, to relate it to something, it's like the ugly hair stage right now. It's at an ugly hair stage. It's it's okay. it's here. It's, it's it's visible. It just doesn't look pretty um at all. I'm not, not to say I don't like certain new rap and I don't I don't that's like to say I don't like the current state at all, but it doesn't from the outside looking in, you know, um it's not the same. It's it's not the same. It's not even the same as it was in 2017. Like it's, it's it's even from that point on, it's still different. So, um, right now I'm I'm not. I've found a new love for rap again because I just related to everything you you just said, and even a year ago I would 100 percent agreed with you. As you know, and I've 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 started singing and I've started writing my own music and producing now. And it's something more challenging and it's more therapeutic when I'm able to make a song and get my emotions out. But I've also found a new love for rapping again and a new hunger for it. Because I and and I think it's because I've heard the current state and I, I know I, um, someone has to rap. Someone has to actually rap here. You know, when you start to hear songs drift in and and keep playing and it all sounds almost the same my biggest you know, pet peeve it, yeah it's it's frustrating it's like but but it almost awakened me back up in a weird way it was like hold on i was like this this could be better this could be way better than where it, where it's at you know so i guess that's to put it in a more uh to put it in a shorter term um yeah, it's it's at an ugly stage, but um, I've every every it goes through a cycle. It's a cycle. It's it's gonna go right back to lyricism at some point. It it always it goes to club. It goes to it's gonna go to club hits for a while, where everything's gonna sound the same, and it's gonna go right back to lyricists, and then it's gonna be, you know, it's all gonna go in one big old cycle all over again. I think we forget that as a as rappers and artists. I think an argument can be made that we are actually in the new golden age of hip hop. And I only say that to say because in the 90s, hip hop was still very much oppressed. Like in the 90s, it was at a point to where it was starting to get some notoriety nationwide, potentially even worldwide to a certain extent, but it was still very much oppressed. They didn't want to play it on, on the radios. They didn't get certain awards. But now we're at a point in hip-hop to where it's so global. It is the number one genre of music in the world. It, it can be considered pop music. 
only because it's been evolved so much. You have so many different sounds to it and everything, and so many different artists and people from different cultures coming into the space. What do you think was the change or the inflection point that kind of led to hip hop being in that ugly hair stage, as you say? Um, I would say the the stage hit, and I'm pretty sure you can agree or at least understand where I come from when I say it came from 2016's XXL freshman class. When you started uh, the Yachty, the, <laughs> the Yachty, the Uzi, the Kodaks, they came in the game. And I actually, I actually liked it at the time. I think it's gone too far, though. I think now all we have are copies of copies because th- these copies were already Lil Wayne copies. Now we got copies of those copies and it's begun, it's begun to a point where I don't even know where the, the, I don't even know who's who anymore. Exactly. Um, and I was not a fan of the 2016 double X um, cover. Actually, that was a point in my career where I was kind of anti new school and everything like that. I was still kind of on the rapidy rap train. Shortly after that, I realized that, hey, music is changing fast, and you either get on the boat or get left behind. But some of those artists, man, they've had longevity like I have never would have imagined. Um, 21 Savage, arguably having his best year up to date. Um, Kodak Black, I'm a huge fan of Kodak Black. Very underrated lyricist, very intelligent man. I wish he would showcase that intelligent side a lot more than we see him getting in trouble, you know, and getting arrested and everything like that. Um, but in terms of what the 2016 um, Double XL magazine signified, do you think it signified a shift from saying, okay, we no longer care about music in terms of the art. We care more about the artist. Do you think that was the time in which that change happened? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's exactly. Um, I mean, just look at look at uh, look at what they had to offer at the time. You know, it was a lot more character driven. It was like um, it wasn't about more the the, the music. It was about more the look at that at that moment you know even even if you want to address the rappers that that aren't you know the Lil Yachty's and the the Kodax we can talk about Lil Dicky coming in it was about jokes with him you know the trainer became funny to laugh at after the Timmy Timmy Turner thing you know it ever since that class it was a lot the image popped out more and then ever since then it's been about the image it's, it wasn't about the music at that time. And from there, that that's where it drifted off to. But where is hip-hop going, though? Do you think that this could have a negative effect on the actual music? Because we have people coming in from all walks of life. We have YouTubers. We have influencers, streamers. People coming in making music, so-called, air quotes, but they aren't really artists. Do you think that is detrimental to the actual art of hip-hop? Um, it's going to be a wild take, but I, I would say no. And here's the reason why I say that. It's because I, uh, art works in, in cycles. Um. People, people know bullshit when they actually see it. Um, the problem is we still tune into it, but it, it won't it'll have a short. It'll have a short shelf life, like everything else. Um, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that stuff sustains sustains the, the test of time. You feel me? Like uh, there will always be, there will always be the the better artists will always rise to the top. I mean. You have artists now that just just about like what six seven years ago were considered garbage are now making the best music ever. You know, um, I just tuned in. It was last year to Lil Yachty's uh, Lil Yachty's new album. Um, Let's start here. 
I was blown mm-hmm. away by that. I was didn't that the see one that. when he was doing the singing and he was kind of doing the alternative thing too? Yeah, yeah. I was. Okay, I was. Yeah, highly, I heard a lot about that. I was. I was highly impressed because I've always been a rock, Pink Floyd alternative fan. So when I heard that, it made me rethink how I how I look at music nowadays. You have to get to a point where you're good. The point blank period. You cannot sustain a career thinking that your facade or your image or your gimmick is going to keep you there. People see through the bullshit and your audience grows. I'm not into what I was into a couple couple years back. You know what I mean? I Back then, yeah. I used to, all I wanted to listen to was fast rap when I first started rapping. I don't... I, bro, I hear someone hit the fast flow. I want to smack him in the face half the time. <laughs> I don't want to listen to that crap. Like, put on some Marvin Gaye or something. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't want to listen to that. Oh, you're at your Marvin Gaye era, too? I'm Brother, Marvin I Gaye. walk around this fucking place like a 70-year-old man listening to my fucking R&B and soul from the 60s and the 70s. I don't even listen to hip hop anymore. People think that I'm playing when I say I don't fucking rap anymore. Bro, I don't even listen to hip hop anymore. I listen to strictly fucking R&B. And man, I agree with you. I think hip hop is in a really interesting place. I do think that there is going to be a decrease in the quality of music. Just looking at the labels business model, she said it's not the same as it was in 2017. Um, But just in terms of the overall culture, I think that the great artists are going to shine through no matter what. But as independent artists, we have to say that, yeah, you know, we can have good music, but we also have to know that that's not all that comes with it. Like, a lot of people see these little shades and they're like, oh, why are you wearing shades? You think you're cool? You're indoors and everything. And I'm like, no, you dumb motherfucker. Branding, right? I'm going to get my own shade fucking brand or something. But when you see the nigga with the dreads and the shades come through, bitch, you know it's Jackie Jordan in the building. <laughs> I say that, I say that, man. You have to be able to have a social media presence. You have to be able to build a community. So that's what we're doing with this podcast. That's what we're doing with all of the other content that we have to come. This is our very first episode of a short podcast with Jackie Jordan. I don't want to make this podcast too guest-based. Now and then I want to bring in great guests like my man Kai here to come in and give you an interesting perspective on music and pop culture. Um, We got a lot of great things coming in this next few weeks. I'm going to have my man Marcus on from UG Moth. He's going to give his side of the story of the whole raw entertainment thing. Um, But, man, before I let you get out of here, man, I just want to catch up with you, man. I know that you're a father now. I want you to talk a little bit more about fatherhood and what's that like and also if you have any new projects or anything that you're working on you want to plug to the people this will be the time to do all that for is yours brother all right uh fatherhood sucks let me stop uh, <laughs> i love my son <laughs> that's why i have no kids ladies and gentlemen <laughs> no, no fatherhood's amazing i i i consider uh waiting longer than I did, but I can't wow. argue being a father. Um, it's the one thing that keeps me busy. It's the one thing that keeps me grounded. And I watch Mr. Rogers. So th- as far as fatherhood, I love that shit. But um, as far as, as far as music goes, production wise, I'll be in about 12 different projects this year coming up. Uh, my hand is very heavy in production right now. Um, as far as my own personal projects, I got three different projects on the way. I got a rock project coming out. I got a 
collab project coming out and I got I got something special coming. I don't wanna I don't wanna uh I don't wanna let everybody know quite yet, but just know something something big's coming coming our way. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. I'm kind of feeling everywhere. Talk to me a little bit about your I don't really know how you pronounce the title of it. Is it 20, 22 o'clock? How do you what's the name of your previous mixtape? Um I wanna say it's up for interpretation, but uh twenty two o'clock is 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 about right. You could you can you could put it like that. Um it's about that's about the time that every adult should be going to sleep. It's ten o'clock. Mm. But military yeah. time is twenty two. It's about the whole thing. Around three or four a.m., ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> hey, me too. But when I oh, heard that, my mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's about it's about sleep deprivation and um, mm. how you uh you go through a quite experience when you withdraw after after sleep deprivation. We all go through it. I mean, come on now. I go to sleep normally around two a.m. 3 a.m., sometimes 5. Um, when you break that cycle after doing that consistently and go to sleep at 10 o'clock, uh, you can resort to a lot of a uh, lot of bad dreaming. Um, you can also you go through a lot of personal experiences that you try to ignore. And that's what all the album's about. It's about going through that process. And you produce your own records, right? Yeah. Yeah, I produce everything myself now. Say, I listened to your last project when I was at work on the clock, you know, breaking my back and shit for fucking two cents an hour. But I must say, that is probably your best produced project to date. I love the production on it. Um, the song making, man, you're, you're getting so, just so, um, so good at crafting your songs and everything like that. So I'm very excited to hear what you have coming up. I know you said 12 projects. Jesus Christ. Man, you you probably need to get to sleep a lot earlier than 22 o'clock, God damn it, Man. Yeah. Jesus, this guy, he's a machine. But man, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I've been dealing with some technical difficulties this whole time. And you didn't even know about it. But to the listeners, it's going to be a work in progress. Um, just from all angles, from the lighting, from the audio, from the fucking, just even the way I'm conducting the interview. Like, I got to get everything in order. So I appreciate you all for tuning in. And I hope you tune in with us. I don't know how often I'm going to do this show. I'm thinking maybe every Wednesday. I don't know if I'm going to do a live stream every time or if I'm just going to pre-record it or whatever. But to the people, I just want y'all to just support a nigga, man. Support a y'all nigga. I'm your favorite starving musician. Emphasis on the word starving. God damn it, I am starving. So please just be patient. This is a work in progress. But, man, my man Kyder feature... Again, thanks for coming to the show. Excited to have you on soon. Especially when your next project comes out. You can come on here and tell us a little bit about that. But until then, I bid you adieu. To all our listeners, I am your host, Jackie Jordan. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of A Short Podcast with Jackie. I want you to please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think about this interview. My man, Kyle, he's going to give you a list of his socials so you can go and follow him on social media. Where can we follow you on social media, Kyle, the feature? Um, Graham, Facebook, all of that. Just type it in. You heard the man, goddammit. Go follow him on all platforms and hit the like on this video. Hit the subscribe button. Click the little bell next to it so you get a notification every time I drop a video. Again, I'm your host, Jackie Jordan. Goodbye.
Good night. Make it home safe, everybody. You don't got to get home, but you got to get the fuck out of here. Hey, right, my man. I'll catch up with you later. You be easy, all right? All right, be easy, man. All right, man.